empowering the younger generation encouraging them to pursue their dreams with unwavering commitment under his guidance million dots has successfully built a vibrant community of skilled traders providing a platform where success stories unfold and flourish welcoming monica ma'am and kens onto this auspicious venue of kerala literature festival 7th edition thank you thank you so much thank you yeah thank you thanks so much and uh, hi hi good evening everyone uh, see uh, for me in this uh, speci special occasion see i am the happiest person to share a stage with uh, somebody who is fantastic as monica helen specifically in my terms because she knows what is finance and uh, obviously uh, the the, uh, the the two important books that she have uh, done is let's talk money and let's talk mutual fund uh what i was uh what i was seriously into this thing is was like uh we know that india and specifically this place south india it's, it's all great place for uh when you when you look into the literacy rates of people uh we boast that we have the best education system we have the best thing but when you look into the uh, financial education side of it it is a bit lower but uh, obviously it is changing and i was actually looking for those cult things that is happening around uh, that would really change people and uh, to my uh, to my thing see uh, your podcasts your books have helped a lot of people and most importantly let's talk mutual fund is now available uh, in malayalam language as well that's money let's talk money i have just got yeah. hold of the book today so this is a translation of uh, Let's talk money, which has been loved so much by all of you. Now we have a Malayalam translation by DC Books, and I've just got the book in my hand a few hours ago. So it's a very, very special moment for me. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, obviously, that book has to enlighten a lot of leaders, and obviously, will we know? And uh, let me start this conversation with a, a very, very obvious question. Uh, see, when we all talk about investments, uh, mutual funds, and all of that. first thing first for a common man side what he'll be thinking is like why should i be investing first of all right uh, what is the point of investing because when you look into a physical or when you look into a instant things there is nothing much that we are losing if you are not investing but when you look into long term it is there is a lot of things we we understand that but obviously when you look into a very common people they might not be thinking in that way so why according to you why do you think people should be investing i'm going to broad base this question a bit and we need to see our role in the way that uh production happens okay so as a factor of production who are we we know factors of production there's land labor, labor capital, capital technology now yeah. so there's land labor capital and technology we are labor we can call ourselves ceo we can call ourselves director we can call ourselves whatever but as a factor of production we are labor we go to work we generate a surplus we consume some of it and some of it is extra exactly. we earn more than what we can use today why do we need to preserve some of it so it's very important to enjoy today so today is extremely important but why do we need to save something for the future think about that exactly. because this factor of production gets sick it gets old it gets out skilled exactly yes there comes a time when the you your you cannot catch up with the skill changes right. now when we see the way technology is making so many jobs redundant mm -hmm. you could have an accident and you could not maybe go to work right right so there are so many factors which make us very vulnerable exactly. to future events of old age of simply not wanting to work after a while which is why my communication is enjoy today mm. but keep something for tomorrow as well Makes that's sense. the whole logic of investing that it is about today and tomorrow right and especially to the young people out there so you know when we are in our 20s we never think we will get old we've all been through that <laughs> okay we've passed through that age and we never think we will be as old as our parents or our grandparents but i promise you for millions of years we have become old every generation passes through this decade of the 20s and becomes 30s 40s 50s there are two ways you can 
come face to face with your future. One is look at the faces of your parents and your grandparents. You will get there. I promise you, you will get there. <laughs> Second is download an aging app. You know what an aging app does? Aging yes, app yes. shows you your face at different ages. So today you are 25. You put your picture, it will show you how you will look at 35. How will you look at 45, 55, 65? And you know, your generation will live till 100. It's not just my blessing, but it's also, <laughs> it's also medical technology. You're going to be living for a very long time. Right. So you need to prepare yourself mentally for being that old. I mean, if you, uh, anyone here watches Netflix? Netflix, yeah? There are some very nice Japanese serials. You know, you watch with Netflix, what happens is you watch different countries productions yes. and you come to know about their culture and a lot of the Japanese stories are based about people in their 60s falling in love because they're going to live till 100 and they're saying I have 40 years ahead of me so I lost my partner this happened to me you know so we are moving towards that time when your generation will be living to well into your 90s so it's important to have this mindset that the first 30, 35 years of my productive life, I will earn a little bit, I will put towards the future. Exactly. That's the only thing. Not for a moment am I telling you not to enjoy today. Okay, 20s is the decade where you are living life at its peak. You know, you, you really feel you can jump off a cliff and fly. I don't want to pull you back. I'm saying, please spend on today. Don't only save, spend today but have a little bit of a habit of saving for the future. Exactly, exactly. That's, that, that's a very different perspective, I would say. The, like seeing ourselves as, lab, as labor, it's a very different perspective of uh, viewing life. Because, you know, obviously, as you said, uh, you know, probably from 20 to uh, 50 would be the right peak of your time, which you have the best performance. But after that, you obviously will have the wear and tear. You'll, you'll slow down. So the other thing, again, because it's a young crowd, what you have to remember is that you have to go on earning current rupees. Because the retirement corpus, if it is put only in safe places mm -hmm. like, you know, fixed return, then the capital doesn't grow, but inflation keeps growing. Right, right. So the idea is to keep earning current rupees as long as you can. So even if you are, say, retiring, there has to be a skill set that you take to the market and mm -hmm. you can earn current rupees. Even at age 60 or 70, there should be something you can do to pay at least a part of your bill. So that's right. something... Keep the skill set honed all through your lives. That's a, it's the principal thing about uh, making money is also earning money. Right, right, right. I get that. And I take that, you know, live today and have a bit of, uh, you know, yeah, to, for tomorrow. That's because tomorrow will come. Yeah, obviously, yes. But, you know, people are, uh, you know, acting as if there is no tomorrow. <laughs> but, yeah, a very, very different and very yes. interesting perspective, I would say. And, uh, uh, you know, when, you, when, you, when we look at, uh, to, especially into people of India, we do feel that uh, people have a very bit awkward or a taboo sort of behavior towards money. Because, you know, money has never been a major subject. Especially in KLF, I, I'm really happy today in the sense, you know, in a literature first, we're speaking money in the sense, it, obviously, finance has to come into mainstream topic. But we haven't been seeing that much. You know, when, in, when you look at a household talk, uh, money has always been a, 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 a sort of talk that which you speak like sex or something, you, 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 you keep it behind the curtain. You, you always make sure that, you know, money is always something which people are not ready to speak out loud. So, uh, wh what do you have an attitude about it? You know, that's so unfortunate. Have we heard of these words, karma, arth, dharma, moksha? Have we heard the four parts of a human being's life? Kam, arth, dharma, moksha. Kam is about enjoyment of life. Arth is about money. So, as part of our legacy, we are taught that both enjoyment of this life and money are as important as dharma and moksha. There are four pillars on which it rests. So, this, uh, and you're absolutely right, there's a shrinking away from the whole money thing that money is evil, money is bad, um, it is the ill-gotten gains. The rich people have done something wrong. Yes. I will put it down to the legacy of the colonialism 
the centuries of colonialism. Mm -hmm. See, we, we became from a very rich country, we became a very poor country. So there was a point where the Indian exports were one third of the total global exports, oh. one third. Today, it's in single digits. Right, right. Okay, so we were extremely wealthy, uh, as, you know, a thousand years ago, and then the colonizations happened, yes. and slowly, and this got accelerated with the British colonization, we lost that wealth. And, you know, when a nation has nothing to look forward to, when you were generation after generation only poor, then you put poverty on a high pedestal. Mm. The only way you can give dignity to yourself is to say that the rich are bad, anyone who has money is evil. Right. I have, I am poor, but at least I have my morals. And you know, interestingly, you see a reflection of this in Indian cinema, in Hindi cinema. <laughs> right, exactly. You, what is that famous, <laughs> uh, how many, you people are too young, but you remember that famous dialogue, Mere paas ma hai? What is, what is that scene there? Here is a poor brother who doesn't have gadi, bangla, dola, chahara, mm -hmm. but he has what? He has ma, he has mother. <laughs> so mother here is symbolizing this high moral ground. Right, right. And the smuggler, Amitabh Bachchan, he has gadi, dolat, bank balance, sab kuch hai. Yes. But he doesn't have the high moral ground. You know, so over time in Indian cinema, we have seen how money has been demonized. Exactly, exactly. Because we were so poor. But I've seen a shift in the movies post-1991. 91 is where the economic liberalization happened. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was a moment in our lives which has changed. So my generation benefited from that first wave of reform. Your generation is benefiting from the reforms in the last 10 years. Mm. And believe me, I have studied economics, I have reported on markets for 30 years. Your generation will just have to work hard, you will all do well. Okay, so you're coming back to your money being evil. That's why we don't discuss it. Because it was seen to be something evil. Only the bad people discussed sex and money. But in our cultural heritage, Kam, Arth, Dharma, Moksha are four equal pillars. Right. So we've got to rediscover this, uh, what I call the wealth mindset. We have forgotten the wealth mindset. We have got into what I call the poverty mindset. Mm. As we rediscover it, I think conversations about money in the homes, on the dining table, will become possible. The right attitude towards money Right, and right. I will just quote uh, something from Sri Aurobindo. He's got this uh, small book called The Mother, in which he talks, there's one chapter four on money. And he, said, he says, there should not be an ascetic shrinking away from money. That shows poverty of spirit. Mm. You don't shrink away from it, but neither do you become its servant. You are a trustee of this wealth force in your hand, and you use it in the service of the divine. Whoever your divine is, Right, so you don't shrink away, you don't chase it, like, but like you, you act like a podcast. trustee. You know, you should have money, not money should have you. You should have <laughs> the money, money should not have you. Right, right. So have you seen some uh, very rich people acting very badly in public places? We've seen them, right? They are very boorish, they are very right. loud. So when I see them, I say, they don't have the money, the money has them. Right. You know, and that is where we have to remember uh, the role of money in our lives. Exactly, and uh, the, the, the specific part you talked about the cinema, it was, you know, uh, it's a very uh, clear example of, you know, uh, because entertainment do have a very big influence in how we become, because that is probably every person spent a lot of time in and is too much involved in it as well when it comes to entertainment. Because, uh, you, like, as you said, earlier movies has took the shift, but still you will see a hero will be always having a very small home with probably no uh, car. If he's having a car, it will be a very basic one. And at the same time, the villain or uh, whoever it is will be having a big yeah, bengal. But it's beginning to change a bit. I'm yeah, beginning yeah. to see, look in Gully Boy. Exactly. Yeah, again, yeah. it was a poor slum boy, but he wanted to make it big for himself, not right. for his mother, not for his sister. Not he wanted it right. for himself. He's saying, apna time aega. Yeah. You know, so that I see is the aspiring Indian youth. Exactly. who are going for this wealth and I think it's a celebration of life. Exactly, exactly, that's correct. And uh, uh, when, we, when we speak about, you know, the money pots, uh, the money things, 
uh, it's as always said, you know, entertainment and a lot of things is starting to shift, taking shift. But the point is, uh, from my side, uh, if I'm not wrong, I think when you look at the whole people in India, uh, the overall internet penetration we have in India is around 45 percentage, I guess, if I'm not wrong. The thing is, uh, the entertainment, the movies, uh, the social media space places, the books, and all of that reaches to a particular layer of Indian culture, I guess. Uh, according to you, what do you think it really takes to get deeper into the, uh, you know, the, the people of India so that a bit more, uh, uh, you know, a bit more people have to have that idea and because, you know, the Indian households, when you look into a place which is below average, you know, where financial status is below average, they have to, you know, they do have, they do receive money, but the way they spend is very bad, I guess, what I have seen or what I have researched about it. But if they had a very clear idea about how the spending has to be or how to actually manage the small amount of money they have in order so that after 10 years or 15 years, they could have a better life. So how do you think that we can actually reach in a bit, yeah. a bit more deeper level? No, so one thing I think the poor are very careful with their money. I think they are far more careful because for them it's mm -hmm. life and death. So there's a book called Portfolios of the Poor, came around 10 years ago and there they track the portfolios, what they do, people who are really at subsistence level. And it shows a very high degree of sophistication of mm -hmm. managing different goals, mm -hmm. trying to live day to day. But I'm going to come back to your thing of uh, why we don't have this, uh, you know, why finance is not so deeply embedded into the country. One piece of data is that till 1980, 60% of the country was below the poverty line. That means we were earning, 60% of us were earning less than $2 per day per person till as recently as 1980. Today, that number is in single digits. Okay, so the last 40 years, we have seen a very sharp drop in absolute poverty. What is absolute poverty defined by the World Bank? Less than $2 per day per person. There are papers from IMF, World Bank, uh, and there's one more, which are putting this number somewhere between either 2% or 10%. Okay, so there's a range. Mm -hmm. But yet, it is, in, it is in single digits that we see absolute poverty. Not for a moment am I saying that we don't have poor, but there is an abjectly poor person. We are seeing that kind of poverty go away. So one is that there wasn't any money till now. Right. We are moving. So as a nation, we are moving towards a lower middle and middle income country. We see ourselves as a poor country. Mm -hmm. We need to internalize the fact that we are moving towards being a lower middle and middle income country. By 2047, they are saying there should be a billion of us in the middle class. One billion Indians in the middle class. That is a phenomenal number, right? So one is that there wasn't money. Mm. Second is, it, it was only in 2014 after Narendra Modi's Jandhan push where he forced banks to open bank accounts that we had 400, I think 600 million new Indians got bank accounts. We were not even bank, banks had not even reached the population. So what is a poor villager with no access to banking do with the financial sector? So this is all very recent. It has just happened. It's happened like uh, these are new products for them. I would say that it's better to reach the first generation financially included slowly rather than have them lose their money to OTP fraud, phishing fraud, so many frauds happen. Yes. So I think we've taken giant strides, but I would rather go slowly into the uh, tier three and villages rather than take risk-bearing financial products and introduce it to a population who has been used to assets like gold, like cattle, like real estate, right? So yeah. I, I would advise caution. Right, nice, nice. See, uh, uh, as you've said, you know, previously we haven't seen money and we are like, uh, let me take that into a, a very, very uh, nearest generation. The thing is, uh, after our colleges and schools and everything, uh, we obviously will get a job. It is then actually people start to think about money by any means because, you know, till that point of time, all of their finances would be handled by their family or somebody else. 
at one point, once they start to work and get their first salary, you know, I used to say that, you know, they treat their first salary as a toy, that get, which is getting for a very small child. They, they don't know what to do with it. They are spending like anything. And, you know, from that moment, they think that, okay, they have a lot of money and they don't know what to do. They're doing a lot of great things. And what happens is they soon get into a debt cycle in such a way that when they get the first salary, they'll get a call from their credit card. Uh, space and they'll get a credit card, they'll uh, max it out, they'll, they'll uh, work to repay the credit card and they'll have the circle going on and on and again. For me, I really think that uh, money is always, you know, a subject to a person if he's, only when he's starting to use it. That is obviously right now it is at the age of probably 20 to 24 when he get the first job. Like, what do you think really we need to change in the household behavior uh, so that we could have a better wealth-minded uh, people or kids basically so the, we've discussed already the conversations in the home mm -hmm. so one is to involve the children in the discussions about money about choices right. uh, the choice between going for a holiday to Goa and staying in this luxury resort versus buying either a vehicle or adding to your education fund you know those choices should actually be left to the children when they're demanding something the trade-off has to be shown that this decision here means this for our future vehicle or education or a certain kind of a house. So involve the children in the conversations about decisions. Second is I think the education system definitely needs to incorporate basic financial literacy exactly, exactly. into the curriculum. Right. Um, I know that Let's Talk Money is a self-help book, but I also find that it's being used as a textbook in many MBA colleges oh, because they, they don't have anything written for them for them to teach out of. So I think it's very important that we start building courseware for schools right. and colleges. And you said that when people begin to earn, and I have to tell you a personal story. I uh, graduated long back from Delhi School of Economics. It's a premier institution of economics. But after doing all of those, you know, pages and pages of trigonometry and uh, econometrics, I didn't know how to write a check. I was financially illiterate. I was a master's in economics, but I, was, I felt I was financially illiterate. So, of course, I taught myself my profession was such, I became a personal finance journalist. I studied and I uh, equipped myself. But, you know, a lot of you might be joining your jobs for the first time or already are in first jobs. Now, how, ma how, ma how long have you worked to get the first salary? Mm. You have studied, your parents have said, do well, study hard, then you go to higher courts. I'm going to tell you something which sounds counterintuitive. I'm saying take six months and spend. Don't save a single rupee. <laughs> for six months, you get that spending out of your system, but don't take any loans. Don't buy on debt. Do guilt-free spending for six months in your first job. From the sixth month, you start a habit of saving, say, 10%. That is not too much to ask. Again, if you read Let's Talk Money, there's a simple system of the cash flow system, how you can separate saving from spending. But I'm saying get this. You know, you've waited so long for that first salary. I think you deserve that six months. Right, right, exactly. Why not just have fun with it? Yes. Buy parents' gifts, take your brother or sister somewhere for a holiday. Exactly. Buy yourself a, whatever it takes. Enjoy that money. But you know that there is a six-month clock ticking. And after that, you're going to start saving a little bit. Mm. I'm not saying save all of it. 10%, I'm sure everyone can save 10%. So that's my communication. Don't go into debt, but try this guilt-free spending for six mm. months. Probably they'll have to find a, a, a space where you know they're not spending too much and they're not saving too much. You know they'll have to enjoy the moment as well as you said it's earlier. Both. It's right. today and tomorrow. Yeah. That is. So you, I've seen families who only save. Mm -hmm. You know they won't even eat an ice cream because it's a gelato. It, it's 200 rupees. Why will mm -hmm. I spend 200 rupees? But you know you have the money. Why not spend it? Right. It is about today. Right. And uh, as we said, you know, to raise, uh, raise wealth-minded kids, you have to have, give them the opportunity to decide. Probably. To raise wealth-minded kids, you need to sort your wealth out first. Right. To raise responsible children, you need to be responsible with money. Yes. Because children do what you do, not what you say. 
Thank you. So you have to set the standard in your actions. Right, right. See, uh, while I was reading an article, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the level of financial literacy we have, it shows. The thing is, uh, I've heard about this uh, numbers, which is 18,900 crores, which is left uh, unclaimed in banks uh, as of 2019, I guess, uh, which is not uh, claimed by any nominees. And after death, they have their money in their bank, which is not claimed by any person or somebody has not done anything with it. You know, it's a huge amount of money, specifically when you look into India and, and this people, you know, it's a huge amount of money. Uh, to add a nominee is a very basic thing that we have to understand. And even that level of financial literacy is not been uh, given to the society. And obviously, the books like you, the authors like you, will make a change, obviously, yes. Because, you know, as you said earlier, the, we, the financial education is not having a proper material itself to teach them. That is why they are using your books. So it, it, is, it is a very, uh, you know, you have to bring in a shift in financial education space where they have to have their exposure to I money. Think, I think there is some move to introduce some basic pages okay. of financial literacy in the school curriculums. They are talking about it. Right. So we are hoping that they introduce it. Yeah. And uh, the funniest part is, no, not the funniest part. Obviously, India is changing. We know uh, how, we have seen how India has been uh, growing since then. But uh, India and UK are the two important countries that we say or we boast about the education system we have. Uh, but uh, when you look into other countries, we have seen uh, US and uh, uh, probably Australia and all have inculcated the financial education as a mandatory education in their school level, which obviously uh, we are hoping uh, to have that. We should have it soon. Exactly, we should have exactly. it soon. And uh, in a person's life, on moving forward, you know, once you have the salary, you're, you're having a very good life, and it's going like that. See, at, at what point do you really think uh, a person should be thinking about Retirement fund. When I, when I say retirement fund, uh, the, the, the ma major thing I would say is that, you know, uh, when I have done a video around uh, retirement fund, one of the funniest questions that I have received uh, on that video as a reaction was this. Like, why do I need to, why, need, why do I need to have 5, 6 crore rupees at 60, rather I would have that at 25, I'll just spend it, at what, what, what all money do I have at 25, I'll spend it and enjoy, why do I need money at 60? So that was the size of attitude, you know, that question might be a mischievous one, who cares, but the thing is, people have that slight attitude of why should I be actually looking at my retirement when I'm all healthy now, as you said. You should reply that you should see in a lot of homes how the grandparents are treated, <laughs> who might not have the money. So it's a very hard thing I'm saying, but uh, money also gives you power within the household. It gives you dignity within the household. So, for anyone in their 20s who's thinking, what will I do with 5 or 6 crore in my 60s and 70s, you should just look at some of the older people in some of the families exactly. who have either they don't have a pension or they have signed away their assets to their next generation. Not in all of them, but in some of them, they are not treated well. And I will tell you a story of a... This is something I heard from one of the sessions that I did. Very, very rich, famous Delhi lawyer. He retired, he passed his practice on to his son, who was also a very prominent lawyer. This old man was walking in Lodi Gardens, mm -hmm. and he met a friend. And the friend wanted to discuss something he read in the paper today. Okay, these are people with like 100 crore of net worth. So this old man who has retired, who has handed over the keys to the son, is walking with his friend, and the friend says, he's discussing a piece of news this morning. The old man says, I get to read the papers a day late. My son reads them on the day, I get them the next day. A newspaper doesn't cost more than a thousand rupees a month. Right. So, for your own dignity, for your own peace of mind, for your own sense of self-respect, you have to have the money at all points in your life, and especially to the women out there. This is not control you hand over to the men. You control the money, because whoever controls the money has power within the household. These things can sound very hard and cruel, but these are facts of life. And because of the work that I do, so many cases come to me, so many stories come to me, that all I can say is that you should have the oxygen mask of money first on you. And especially women will look after the entire household, but you be financially independent first. Right, so right. that's my answer to people who don't see the point of having 5-6 crore in their 60s. 
you will be dependent on your children. Exactly. See, uh, they'll have to foresee a bit. And uh, as you said, you know, uh, it, it is always, it, it is very important because, you know, once the labor within you is weakening up. Just you remember have, your factor of labor. You yeah. get old, you get sick, <laughs> you can, get tired. <laughs> everything can go wrong. We have to, you know, right, exactly. At that point, you know, and uh, people are actually unaware about uh, the fact that uh, uh, they, these mutual funds or index funds or whatsoever investment vehicle they are on, it gives a certain kind of returns. The thing is, uh, you know, in, in a very uh, recent uh, discussion that I had with a few of the people at my office, uh, you know, we have few of my clients as well there. So we were we talking about uh, uh, mutual funds and everything, and I was, you know, roughly you, you know, was, uh, the whole concept was, the topic was about uh, investments. Basically, they had a chunk of money with them, so they want to invest it somewhere, so they're just taking some advice with me. So I said, uh, see, uh, investments and all of that, you can do in mutual funds, index fund and all of that. And you can get somewhere roughly around 12% uh, annually, I said. And I said that, which accounts to around 1% monthly. Probably every month you might not be getting 1%, it goes up and down, but in a whole year you might get 12%. For let's say for 50 lakh rupees you have, you might get somewhere around 50,000 rupees every month average. It is possible in mutual fund. So when, when I said that particular thing, this people was like, do you, uh, like, is it, is it really happening here? They, they, they had no idea of this thing happening here. Because the thing is, uh, the first thing people think about doing when they have a 50 lakh is that they are going to buy a home for their own or they are going to put it in an FD the max. So uh, what is the suggestion that you have, you know, what are the different uh, investment vehicles that you would suggest that people to have to invest basically if they have a, a you know, corpus of amount with them? So the thing that which is really important is if you have a corpus you have to decide what you want you want to grow it exactly if you want to grow it long term then you entrust it to the stock market mm -hmm. for long term investing if you need an income out of it then you don't use the stock market mm -hmm. there is no shame in being in fixed deposits okay so if you want current income you don't put it in equity it's only when you have money for the long term that you put it into equity and this is something that you will have to educate yourselves on, right. on what is equity, what are debt products, how to use them. So there's a product called an index fund. Everyone's heard of the Sensex? That's the stock market index on 30 of India's biggest companies. These companies continue to come into the Sensex and go out. But at every moment, some of the biggest companies, most uh, well, good companies, uh, stable companies make up the Sensex. Do you know what the 30-year average annual return on the Sensex has been? It's been 12% a year for 30 years. 12% average annual return it has given. Now, have you heard of Warren Buffett? Everyone's heard of Warren Buffett. What is Warren Buffett's advice to people like you and me? I put myself in your category because I know finance. But I don't know enough finance to buy any stocks. I am afraid of not knowing enough and not being able to monitor it on a day-to-day -day basis. So I like to stay with mutual funds. Right? So what does a person like Warren Buffett say to retail investors? He says, you buy the index, you keep funding it, and you forget about it. He doesn't say you, he says you cannot time markets. You cannot predict what the markets will do. Exactly. So therefore, index-based investing is supposed to be the best way for new retail investors who are trying to get the benefit of wealth creation that equity gives to you. So why do we want equity? We want wealth creation. Mm. How does equity create wealth? Because businesses make profits. Exactly. They have growth. That gets reflected on the stock price. And as the stock price goes up, you make a profit. Okay, so that's, the stock market is a science. It's not a lottery. You know, you don't go today and you double your money and you come out. The way that I see investing for us is that when you especially invest through mutual funds, is that you spend a lot of time selecting the schemes. It's like planting a tree. <clears throat> you never actually ever redeem. You spend so much time researching and then buying a mutual fund scheme that I call them forever funds. These are forever funds. You never ever sell. You just pluck the fruit and you eat that. You leave the tree for your next generation. So that's the mindset change mm -hmm. of investors that need to happen when you, especially new investors, want to get in and they want to get out. Right. 
My question is, why do you want to get out? What do you want to do with the money? If there's a goal which has been met, that's fine. But if, if you don't need the money, let it stay in the market. So when I joined work, this is 1991, the Sensex was at 2000. It was at 2000. Were you investing then? That's the thing. I wasn't. I didn't have money at all. Oh. Even like now I think I should have put at least 500 yeah, rupees. <laughs> That's my only regret is that I didn't start investing at that age when I should have. I started investing much later. But what I want to tell you is every time the markets went up from 2000 when it went to 4000, mm. it'll crash, it'll crash. 4000 to 10,000. Oh, this is a scam. 10,000 to 25,000. Oh, this will definitely fall now. High. Of course it fell, but it came back. Same thing, 40,000, 50,000, 60,000, 70. At every milestone, I hear this, that this market is going to crash. Right, right. Of course it crashes. But then because there's growth in the companies, it comes back. So you have to, be, you have to put your seatbelts on. You have to be ready for the long ride. When you go on a, uh, when you go to an amusement park and you sit on a roller coaster, what do you do? You sit, anyone sat on a roller coaster? Yeah? What do you do? They strap you in, right? Riding in the markets is same. You strap yourself in, you build an emergency fund, you have a cash flow system, you buy sensible insurances, and then you can take the volatility, which is a roller coaster, off the stock market. You get there safe, you make your returns, but you don't have to worry when the markets suddenly crash. So right. that's the mantra that I can give you. Yeah, that's, that's you know, uh, the importance of index fund, uh, as you said, is, you know, it's, it's, it's giving so fantastic return over this much years. And, uh, and we are so lucky in the sense, in a very optimistic way, we have seen the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, and we know how the market performed. 30% during... drop. Yeah. yeah. See, we have seen uh, Nifty from 12,000, 13,000, it dropped to 7,000. And in a span of probably five, five to eight months, months, it came back. It was, it doubled. And, and yeah. from that point, it when you look stopped. at now, it's 118, 120% up again. And you know, at that time when the markets dropped by 30%, I know of people who sold the entire, people who should have known better. Yeah. That's the time you hold on. Right. If something is going cheap, you buy more of it. Yes, exactly. You know, so this idea that if gold prices fall, you buy gold. Mm -hmm. The stocks are the same, right, you know, right. so, that, so that bit of education needs to happen that this is not a lottery. It's not a satta bazaar. There is a science to long-term investing. Mm. And if you want to predict, there's a simple formula. You take the GDP growth, you add inflation to it. And a little more, you know, you, there's something called equity premium. I won't go into it. But you just add GDP and inflation and you get a rough idea of what kind of return you can see in the future. So if you have faith in the Indian economy, I do. I think we are on, we've done a lot of structural reform in the last 10 years. I think we are poised for a multi-decadal growth period. There will be ups and downs, but I think we are, we are, we are going at 7.3. We hope to sustain a seven. You add 5% inflation. What number are we reaching? We're reaching 12 to 14% on the index, only over the long term, not year on year. Right, right, exactly. So you have to be, you have to be very careful when you invest in markets. Yes. You have to follow the rules. If you don't follow the rules, you will always lose. Mm -hmm. And the rules are that when you start index investing, you stay the course, you do not redeem when the markets fall. In fact, that's the time you add money to it. You have what I call an asset allocation in place. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, split between your safe assets, which are called debt, and equity, which is the risky asset, that ratio is very important. You know, should I be 70% in equity? Should I be 50% in equity? Those are individual decisions that you take. Mm -hmm. But once you take that decision, that becomes your cue to either buying more or selling, right? So that asset allocation becomes the most important decision that you take in your financial life. So when you take the example of, uh, the market crash in 2020. Yeah. Suppose I had an allocation of 60% equity, 40% debt. That was the time it fell to 40% equity because of the fall in the market. But if my allocation was 60, I should have been buying equity then. Right. So your cue to buying and selling comes out of your, it, the power is in your hands. 
And that's my communication over and over again. Don't look at outside factors. Don't, you know, somebody will say the market is overbought. <laughs> you should get out of everything. That's not, it may be true for that person. What is your asset allocation telling you? And you act according to the power that you have in your hands. Exactly. And uh, as you said, you know, long term, being, staying long term is the key. And uh, also, when you uh, look at the, uh, you know, the overall performances and everything, it's a great place. We have a great place to invest. And uh, stock markets, as you said, is a place of science, not a place for you to, you know, double your money in two days. And, you know, while we were talking in the uh, backstage, you said about this thing, you have zero stocks in your portfolio. I have no stocks <laughs> in my portfolio. And I'll tell you why. So I write about money. I speak about money. I know finance. But I don't want to spend all of my day worrying about my money. See, understand the difference. Exactly. That I don't want to every day worry about my money. I want to have a system so that the money is working in the background. It leaves me free to do the things right. like talking to you all about money, but still coming and talking to you all, <laughs> traveling, reading, doing whatever else I like to do. Right, right. So the idea is that I don't want to buy stocks because I'll have to monitor them. I'll have to worry about uh, the war in the Middle East escalating or not. Okay, because if it escalates, our energy prices go up. Mm -hmm. Then what happens to inflation? So, or, or if uh, there is a change in some company's uh, leadership, what does it mean for my stock? Mm -hmm. There are so many variables yes. when you do direct stock investing exactly. that I feel I don't have the inclination, I don't have the time, and I don't want the risk. Right. An average mutual fund scheme has between 30 to 50 stocks, which means if you have one scheme, you're already diversified. Right. The chances of all 50 going to zero are zero. The chances of all 50 stocks going to zero are zero. <laughs> the chances of two stocks going to zero are very high. The chances of two stocks doing 100% are very high. The chances of a 12% return on an average are very high. So it's a, it's a probability thing. What is it that you're expecting the markets to do for you? And uh, this is also a message that I could give to audience that, you know, when you uh, are planning to invest in sort of stocks, it takes your time. Only if you have the time to invest, in, like basically I'm talking about the time quadrant. If you have that time to invest, you can go for the stocks, but that is another case. But otherwise, mutual fund is a great tool for you to have your money in because as you said, well, Especially it is for new investors. Exactly. Uh, I mean, if you don't understand things like balance sheets, if you don't understand things like PE ratios, net margin, gross margin, uh, if you, the capex of what a company is doing, what is the IRR on investment, if you don't understand these terms, what are you doing in the stock market? You should not be there. Why are you swimming in the deep when you can't even swim? Why are you jumping into the deep end of a pool when you don't know how to swim? So stock market is like that. You have to be a swimmer to be able to negotiate the ups and downs of individual stock buying and day trading. So therefore, for new investors, especially for people who are taking risk for the first time in your lives, you have to go the lower risk way. Right. The lower risk way is mutual funds and within mutual funds, not active, but passive, index-based investing. That's your lowest cost, safest way to get the returns that the market probably will give. Right, right. And uh, then coming back to uh, your book, uh, Let's Talk Mutual Fund. See, uh, obviously, it will be a guide for us to understand how the mutual fund works and what are the basics and all of that. For sure, we understand that. Can you uh, give a very uh, basic and small idea on what mutual fund is or how it works for that the audience get a proper understanding about you know, how the mutual fund works and what is it actually? No, so it's a collective investment scheme. So a mutual <laughs> fund simply collects money from different people, collects it, and then invests it either in stocks, bonds, gold, or combinations of these. So mutual fund is not just investing in equity. It also invests in bonds. It also invests in gold. And now you have real estate mutual funds called REITs. Right. Right. And you have combinations of these. Hybrid funds are there, which do both debt and equity. You have multi-asset schemes, which also put gold into it. So. You can go to the asset class directly when you buy a stock directly or a bond directly, or you can go through a collective investment scheme where fund managers exactly. who are professionals, who are finance specialists, 
they do the stock picking, they do the bond picking, and they manage the portfolio. So it's essentially you're handing, you're hiring an investment manager. Exactly. So instead of that investment manager being particular to you, you are, it's like riding the metro. Exactly. There is a definite path. The metro says which station it's going to go to. So you, if, if you want to go to that station, you buy that fund. If you want a large cap, then you buy a large cap fund. If you want a small cap, then you buy a small cap fund. So the labeling on the fund is very important. One thing I want to talk about in this book, Let's Talk Mutual Fund, I've spent a whole chapter on telling you about the role of the capital market regulator, SEBI. You've heard of SEBI. Oh, that's the regulator who sets the rules that companies have to follow. So SEBI has put investor protection in the heart of regulations, especially where mutual funds go. I have been a part of the Mutual Fund Advisory Committee for 11 years in the past. And we have been part of so many debates where investor interest has been put hard-coded into the product. So you will have to read the chapter to understand how exactly that has happened. But so the regulator cannot make it safe from market up and down. Understand the difference. Huh? Market volatility, regulator can do nothing about. Regulator cannot assure you a return. They can assure you that nobody will run off with your money. Right. They can assure you there'll be no fraud. Exactly. They can assure you that the costs that the mutual funds are charging are below the ceiling that the regulator fixes. So it's putting order in the market. And investors who've understood it are coming to the market. You know what the SIP book is, the SIP is 17 and a half thousand crore a month. Mm. One and a half trillion rupees investors like us are putting into the market, into the risk part of the market, simply because, because a lot of investors are understanding that this is a stable and safe way to get market return, to, get, to, to participate in the Indian stock market especially. Right, right, and uh, specifically when you uh, talked about this, uh, uh, you know, regulator, but we are really fortunate to have a very strong regulatory SEBI because we do. Yes, because absolutely. You know, in, in terms of markets, in terms of mutual funds, and all of that, uh, the, the, we just need to look at how the U.S. stocks is performing. And when you look at the Indian market, you will see how safe it is Indian markets for anybody. So that, that's that's a great fortune we have. And one more question that I have, one more doubt that I have is regarding uh, the exit of a fund. You said that you know what's the point of exiting? Like. Uh, when you start to invest, everybody will have this thought of when I should be actually exiting the uh, investment that I've been making. Like, uh, how do we, how do we, can we, like, how can we actually give a picture about when is the right time to exit? Uh, because obviously there will be different goals around it, I guess. There is, there is a different purpose for each funds. Uh, so how, how can we actually plan an exit when it comes to the mutual fund? So thing? exit is either if you have invested for a specific purpose and that goal is reached whether it's a higher education or a marriage or a mm -hmm. uh, down payment for a house. If that goal is reached, you redeem, you sell, right. and you get out. So it's always nice to have a goal-based yeah. investment. But there's also investment that you do for the long term. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're doing investment for your retirement, mm -hmm. then you're not redeeming at all. You're right. just letting it ride. Right. That's what I'm saying, that you just, you plan to pluck the fruit of that tree, right. you never cut it. Right. But the others you redeem, and look, the funds are a lot of the time similar. So the fund for your retirement might also be the fund which you're using partly for your home goal or something else. So, uh, you know, then you don't sell all the units. You sell what you need and you keep the money in the market. Right, right. You keep it going. Get it, get it, get it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. And uh, I think that is the time we would ask uh, questions to or we like basically if at all you have any questions <laughs> regarding money or uh, mutual funds or anything, please, yes, yes, please. What are your thoughts on uh, investments in real estate in light of uh, the, uh, you know, current times in which uh, the real estate market is being uh, disciplined and regulated? You know, I find real estate a very difficult market in India. So when in the West you have uh, 
regulated markets, you have mature markets. I find several problems with real estate in India. One big problem is the presence of cash. So for me, it is very difficult to deal with an asset where you have to turn your white money into black. And once you ride that tiger of having cash in the property, there's always, whenever you sell, you will get a part of it back in cash. So one part of the problem remains that it is a, uh, it's a, it's a difficult asset. Second, it's not, you know, the property values still are fairly inflated. One way to understand residential real estate investing is to see, and if you're doing it for investment and not for own living. If you're living in your own house, it doesn't matter. You can buy whenever you want. But if you're investing in real estate, you have to see the return. What return are you getting? The way to do it is to calculate annual rent divided by the capital value of the property. I'm not taking into account maintenance costs, building costs, nothing. On a gross level today, the yield on real estate is between one and a half to three percent. How much does PPF give me? Seven, around seven percent tax free. Of course, there are limits to PPF. What has the Sensex index fund given me? About 12 percent. With real estate, the problem really is that uh, so that, that's one part of the problem. The other is that the pr problem is it doesn't make investment sense to me because the rent that I get is a fraction of the EMI that I will pay. So a lot of people leverage. There's some people who like to leverage. You know, there's this whole idea that you should use the bank's money. But that doesn't make sense in India. It makes sense in the US. It doesn't make sense in India because my rent and my EMI are two different numbers. My EMI is five to 10 times the rent that I pay. If the rent is 10,000, the EMI is going to be almost a lakh. So if I'm borrowing, my rent payment doesn't make my mortgage. So that doesn't work. Then I have a problem with the, you know, it, it, the liquidity is very difficult. Once you get used to mutual funds, and you need like 50,000 rupees, you will just tap some things and in one day your money is out. In real estate, you can't sell one room. You've got to sell the whole thing. There are transaction costs of buying, selling, uh, finding a counterparty who wants to buy. So I find real estate very difficult asset to manage, to hold, to intersect with. So I personally, I prefer to have investments only in the financial sector through the mutual funds because I feel that I would need the help of lawyers to buy real estate, to maintain it. I will need a maintenance manager who will fix a leaking tap or he, who will fix the building when it needs maintenance. I don't want to spend my time. So it's also a personality type. There are people who have uh, help who can do all of this. It might make sense for them. But overall, I remain very, very uh, fearful of real estate investments. What if the tenant doesn't leave? Yeah. So those are the questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, w I would like your advice on one thing. If I want to use my investments as a secondary source of income, so what tools would you advise? Rather than saving? Your investment as a secondary tool of income would require a very large corpus. Okay. So, you know, my suggestion would be that you get to an age where your corpus is large enough that it, you can enjoy the income from it. Yeah, I mean, how much should that corpus be before? No, so it, see, you have to, we don't know, it depends on what your spending habits are. Okay. But typically, by your mid-50s to 60s, your corpus should be large enough that you don't have to go to work. That's the idea. But at a younger age, don't expect your investments to sustain your life. You should, your from 25 to... 55 is the age that you accumulate. It's called the accumulation stage. You're accumulating for the time when you will disperse from that corpus and generate an income. Okay? I know, suppose if um, I'm in a situation where uh, I want to follow my passion and I'm in that field of work, but the yeah. return, I mean, the income in that field of work is not so great. But I want to use my income as, uh, and my investments as a second. Uh, no, that's fine. See, then every specific situation would be different. And 
your passion will have to at some point generate the money. Otherwise, you're eating into your capital. So there is this, uh, you know, the passion at some point has to sustain your livelihood. So I would be, if I have a, if I have a clear direction ahead that I will take two to three years for this passion to start paying me back and then I will rebuild my capital again. That's fair enough. But, uh, you know, a passion just for its own sake, if you don't have the capital, is difficult for sustenance. Those are the hard truths. <laughs> yeah, you wanted to ask. Hello, ma'am. Uh, my question is about uh, mutual funds. Uh, there is a general perception that mid-cap funds and small-cap funds are currently overvalued. So, it would, be the, would it be the right choice to invest in large caps in the current market scenario? I always take what I call the Thali approach, where uh, my portfolio has little bits of everything in the proportion that suits my risk appetite. So, I personally never time markets. I have an allocation in mind. So, even in the equity, there is an allocation to the safe large cap or index. There's an allocation to mid cap. There's an allocation to small cap. It's 50, 25, 25, okay? That's the allocation typically which people should use. 50% in index large cap, 25 in mid cap, 25 in small cap. No matter what the market does, you stay with that. If the small caps run up, this 25 becomes 35, that's your cue to sell. It's not the overvaluation in the market, it's your cue, it's your asset allocation. So, see, if you start listening to people, then you're constantly confused. The way that I like to look at money is I need to have the power in my hand. This is my asset allocation. I have decided on a 25% in small cap. This part of my portfolio is now 35-40%. It's too high. So I will sell small cap and invest in the part of my portfolio which has not done so well. Okay, so that's just the difference of looking at markets from inside out or outside in. I would like to have the control in my own hand. Uh, what factors we should uh, consider while choosing a broker for mutual fund investment? Uh, and also, how can it affect the investment strategy? Also, please compare right. with the uh, direct funds. No, so basically, when you want to select a mutual fund, you've got to do uh, as much work as you do in finding the one in your life, okay? It's almost like that. That much research you do on the fund if it's an active fund. Passive funds are easier to handle. Uh, again, if you read the book, Let's Talk Mutual Funds, I have systematically taken you through the paces of understanding consistency of returns, how to analyze risk, how to evaluate shortlist categories and then funds. So there is a whole science to selecting mutual funds. You don't just go pick last year's winner. That's a sure way to lose money. A fund which has been in the top quartile for the last 10 years is a good candidate. It's showing a good report card. I don't want to buy a fund which is the top of the list because that fund could be at the bottom of the list next year. So again, a very stable middle of the ground route where you're looking for consistency of performance, you're looking at something called risk-adjusted return. Again, I have described it in great detail in the book that how much risk per unit of return has the fund manager taken. I want the return, but I want moderate risk. The good thing about mutual funds is all of this is very well disclosed by the mutual funds. So they will disclose uh, sites like Value Research, will give you the alpha, They'll give you the R square. They'll give you the sharp ratio. As you go into this, you will have to understand. When you go into active fund investing, you'll have to know some of these technical things. If you don't understand it, stay with an index fund. That's all I can say. Okay. <laughs> One last question, I think. At the back there. No, you have the time. I think the time is up. Oh, OK. okay. So, all right. Thank you. You've been a great audience. And I can only wish you all a very rich money journey. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>